Okay, we'll make a bit of a start. Um, so I'm Kate and this you're in the barley grass and grain storage workshop. If you're after grazing standing crops, adjuvants or the cedar demo, you're not in the right place. Um, so this is your cue to leave. Um, and so the way today's session will run is I'll just like to quickly introduce Simon Cook, um, a farmer from west of Hopeton and John Rennie who farms around the Barry Willick area. Um, so the, what we'll do here is I'll give a bit of a spiel for a couple of minutes about barley grass um, and then we'll throw open to a discussion about barley grass with these two up here. So if anyone's got any questions, keep them in mind and we'll have a mo roving mic growing around. Um, so barley grass discussion will run for about 20 minutes and then we'll pass over to Chris Warwick and Brooke Bennett who will be speaking about grain storage for the 2019 harvest. Um, so, barley grass is becoming an increasing problem in Australian cropping systems. As we keep changing our farming practices, barley grass keeps changing its popula populations, which just makes it a bigger and bigger headache. Um, research has shown that barley grass is increasing its dormancy length, meaning it's germinating later. And this is a pretty big problem as um, you have incredibly limited pre-em options, and then, so you're relying heavily on the knockdown. But if it germinates later, or you've sown your crop dry and early, you haven't got that control mechanism op open to you. Barley grass also struggles with post-harvest weed seed control. Um, barley grass sheds most of its seeds about this time of year. Um, so it's too late to put the seeds in a hay bale or in the header front, and in a lot of cases, the plants are too low to do this anyway. So we know it's a problem for our BCG members across the Wimmera and Mallee and we've had several reports from, er from members in particular areas that they're having an increasing problem with barley grass. So to try and work out what's the best way to control barley grass locally, BCG is working on a GRDC funded project with the University of Adelaide looking at the best local control strategies for barley grass. Um, and that's a specific project for the low rainfall zone so it's really applicable to growers in the Mallee. So one part of this project is that we're running a trial on how to control barley grass, um, looking at which herbicide options and which rotations are likely to give us the best control. Um, and these treatments were just decided on at a local committee um, made up of farmers. So what we're doing in the trial is as close to possible as what people are doing on their farm. So this trial is at Nullawool in a really high pressure barley grass paddock which is great for the trial but unfortunately it's not here today. But I would just like to take a moment to thank our generous site host Cameron Warren and say that there will be a crop walk there in 2020 if anyone wants to put that in your diaries 12 months out. Yes I'll do anything to boost attendance at a crop walk. Um, the second part of the project is we're trying to look at herbicide resistance to barley grass. As is, in, as is pretty limited chemical control options, it's a high risk for developing resistance to the options we have got. Um, Gurjeet Gill um, from University of Adelaide did a survey last year, so we know the data is pretty current, pretty relevant, and he found that 21% of populations are resistant to Atlantis already, um, and there's low level resistance to Kuzalifop, so Targa, and also Intervix, which is increasingly concerning for those who are relying on clear field rotations to clean the barley grass up. As part of the project, we have got free resistance tests for growers, so if anyone's got any problem patches on their farm, please come and see me and we'll arrange to get that tested for free. So now I'd just like to introduce John and Simon again. Um, we're about to launch into the discussion. Um, so if there's any questions, we'll have a mic going around on the floor. Um, and so to kick things off, I'll start with the first question. Could you guys just start, please, by explaining a little bit about your farm, where it is, what you grow? Yep. Yeah, that works. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, so obviously we farm out uh, west of Hopeton, Hopeton and... Um, We've got a pretty strong hay program and about 10 years ago, I suppose, we started to see these issues of barley grass arising in paddocks, especially where we we're trying oats on oats. Um, it'd start off with a little patch or on a fence line and uh, the mower would then obviously grab it and then we'd rake, it'd put in a row and then we'd rake it and as we know, barley grass seeds a lot earlier and 
Uh, from then on, then the rake will rake it out into the paddock more. The baler won't pick it up, and then the trouble will just spread. And that's about yeah, where our dramas have started anyway. Yep. And what about you, John? What do you grow on your farm? Is it working? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, well, it's not a as yet not a huge issue on our farm, but um, I've just noticed that probably when we try and tighten a cereal rotation. Um, we have a few issues and at the moment probably just dealt with it using like a clear field or, or something like that which we don't really like to do just growing a, a clear field cereal variety just to um, you know cope with barley grass but I think the main problem as you said before is that the pre-emergents don't really do a lot to it other than probably some of the more expensive ones and it's just one of those sleeping problems I think on our farm that if we don't really get onto it now, in the future, I can really see it being an issue. Yeah. Um, so you said at the moment it's not really that big of a problem, but what do you think could increase the risk of it becoming a bigger problem? If it's a sleeping issue, what could wake it up? Well, I think it's become more of an issue because, you know, we all like to sow as early as we can or we do in particular in dry sowing, so you often don't get that the knockdown of barley. Um, we grow a lot of, of legumes, so you get an opportunity there. But again, it's all uh, you know, relying on chemicals all the time. So basically, I think probably most people have, have seen this on their farm. You just get these patches, and even like Simon was saying, that patch, then it gets a little bit bigger, then it gets a little bit bigger, and before you know it, um, you know, it's taken over the whole paddock. So yeah, in the past, pretty much done it by rotation, either growing legumes there or um, Clearfield variety, so just a chemical, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Simon, you said it's becoming increasingly worse in your hay phases. Is that cereal hay, vetch hay? Uh, yeah, so as <coughs> John touched on earlier, we all so early now, and we don't use any pre-emergence at all. Um, we haven't for a fair while now, even in cereals. Um, so it's pretty close spacing, seven inch spacings and that. And, um, what'd you say again? You're doing cereal hay or vegetable? Yeah, so that's right. Um, so it's in, in our cereal hay as well, but we have to now, even though our vetch is still going to be hay, we have to spray our grasses twice rather than just once and expect except a little bit of rye grass in a vetch I don't get too stressed about but now this barley grass is just seeding on us and we have to spray it twice to uh, to stop the seed from spreading and then hopefully try and go to a canola after that now will be um, a plan and then a clear field um, will be the next part of the rotation and then it'll be back to a legume again as a way to try and combat this barley grass. Yep. And is that your ideal rotation or is that something you've had to adopt to try and get on top of the barley grass? Uh, it's something that I'll have to adopt. We always go a legume and then two cereals. I haven't sown a lot of canola. I use it more as an opportunity, probably. Uh, I pick hay's probably got the run of the mill on our farm, gets our good ground. After a legume, it's always goes to hay. Where now is, after a legume, I need to start putting more canola into the rotation. I think um, to keep getting that whack of on grass, on the barley grass, because it's just seeding in our yep. oats. Yep. Are there any questions on the floor? And the crickets are chirping, but that's all good because I've got a list up here. Um, so you've spoke about trying to control barley grass both of you with chemicals, what kind of chemicals are you using? Herbicides obviously, but... Yeah, well, well obviously in the legume phase you use your group A's, so I think, um, you know, the FOPs are still working pretty well on, on that particular grass at our farm and the DIMS, and then the clear field, but that's not an ideal rotation. We're trying to get away from using the clear field technology and then it's sort of you think you know we've got our brome clear cleaned up and you and then barley grass pops up so um, then you're back onto that clear field sort of treadmill again which we really don't want to be there but yeah they're basically the 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 ways I mean 
canola is probably good in terms of the crop competition if you can get it up and, and growing as well. But again, we use canola more as a, an opportunity crop as well. And um, so, yeah, I suppose you don't like um, weeds to dictate your rotation, but I mean, they, they end up sort of forcing you into things that you wouldn't, you don't normally want to do. And what about you? If you're not using pre-ems, are you more relying on your knockdown or sowing too early for a knockdown and try and catch it in crop? Or? Uh, yeah, so as I touched on there earlier, I suppose I'll do two sprays with the Group A, which are still working, and then I'll try TT Canola. Um, obviously, you're going to be using Group A there again. Um, and then I'm going to have to switch to then a Group B which I'm not too stressed about. We haven't used it a lot on our farm anyway. Um, so I'm glad I've still got that up our sleeve a bit to use it. I reckon if I, in four years I've got a problem paddock now, and I reckon in four years with that rotation and then coming through again with another legume, I reckon I should be able to have a fair crack at the grass. Yeah, but that means it'll be nearly four years before you're back to a hay rotation. Yep, that's right. So that's what we touched on. And I'd hate <laughs> for weeds to dictate our our farm plan a bit, but um, if we want to keep going forward, sometimes you, we've got to put these things first, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you said, I don't know, you probably started seeing it as a problem 10 years ago. And when you think back, what other weeds have you controlled in that 10 year period? Like most people, are you on top of the rye and the brome and that, and now you've seen barley grass emerge? Both of you? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm, as I touched on, I suppose, because we've got a strong hay program, rye grass, I don't find an issue. If it's in a bale, it's good. If there's a little bit there and it goes in a bale, it doesn't worry me. Hay's really good for that and brome grass also works really good and then obviously I said earlier with trying oats on oats and that started with that little bit on a fence line or sheep coming out to a trough from trees and then just having that couple of years of letting it seed set it's amazing how quick a small problem can become a big problem. Yeah exactly the same you, <clears throat> we don't do a lot of hay just sort of opportunity hay and I mean that's the big thing at the moment, I, if, to, if you've got a ryegrass problem, hay's a great way to, to clean that up, and brome as well. So we've basically got on top of our brome and then you have a little few issues with rye and you get on top of those, but then the barley grass sneaks in sort of underneath both of those. So yeah, you feel like you're chasing your tail sometimes, but um, we've still got the opportunity to do hay for those other two weeds, but it Obviously, from Simon's experience, it's not going to do much for, for barley grass. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting you know, to think about all these different things we've got to use, but um, there's one grass that's sort of escaping all of the things that we use at the moment. Yeah, yeah it's interesting you say that. So over in South Australia, they did, did a um, swathed a paddock in 2017 at 14 centimetre height on the 13th of September, so two days time, and SA uh, in the York Peninsula are probably a week or two in front of us. Um, but when they did the survey, they found that 70% of the barley grass seed had either shed or was below 14 centimetres and wouldn't make it into the cutting bar. So if you're letting 70% of your seed escape each year, you're gonna struggle to control it. Um, but another question for people who are on the floor is what advice would you give to farmers who maybe have one or two problem patches? What would you recommend to stop them having problem paddocks? Well, we've tried a few things. One, when they were small, I just went out with um, a bit of Roundup and tried to just blow out the patch to, to stop it getting away. But that patching out stuff always gives you very limited time because there's always another patch that you miss. So I think you've, yeah, and you can go to a, a long fallow, but then you don't seem to get the germination of everything there, but that does help a little bit with barley grass because it usually shoots pretty well. But I think you've got to monitor your paddocks pretty closely and just get onto it quickly. And if it doesn't become a problem, well then you haven't got a problem. Yeah, well, I'd be exactly the same. I sprayed 120 foot out off a fence line this year thinking oh, yeah, I've only got barley grass 
along the fence line and then when it comes out into head, it's amazing how much I had out in the paddock. <laughs> I've got shitloads actually. And uh, I'm confident with a four or five year plan with that rotation, I reckon I should get it back under control pretty well, I reckon. So long term planning is really important? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Are there any questions from the floor at all? No, I'll come up with another one off my list. Um, so you've said that you're relying on, uh, Simon, that you're relying on, uh, sorry, John, you're relying on Clearfield a little bit to try and clean that up. Is that a rotation you'd like to try and shift away from? And are you a little bit concerned by barley grass that might be resistant to intervix? Uh, well, yes, I hadn't heard that, that one, but um, yeah, we'd like to get off the Clearfield bandwagon. I mean, it's getting a little bit easier in the respect that the varieties are a, a, a little bit better in terms of the yield performance, and also now we're getting some, you know, lentils and things that are tolerant of, of the residue. But I think our long-term plan is that we'd like to, to get away from, from that chemistry, if we could. Yep. Yeah. What other options do you reckon you would be forced to use if it wasn't, no, if it became resistant to Clearfield, what would be your next option, do you reckon? Well, the, the option that you just got to, like Simon was, was talking about before, you just got to do, uh, you know, legume, canola, sort of where you can use your group A's and maybe a, a long a chemical fallow or something like that, I think it'd be really what you'd have to do, yeah. yeah. Um, and have you tried any control methods for barley grass that haven't really worked? Any mistakes that other people hopefully won't re repeat? Oh, well, ours is... I don't want to repeat myself, but hey, you think, oh, yeah, you'll get most of your seeds in a bale and it'll disappear, but as soon as that mower hits it, it'll bash the seed off it because it's it sheds so easily. And then that rake touches it, so you go from this row, then you're pulling two in together. So then I'm spreading it out into here again, and, the, and your pickup hits it. Then you just end up with these strips down your paddock, like it, it makes it that much. I've got a shock in how bad hay can actually spread it. It's as bad, it's as, bad as a header. Yeah, well, my advice would be, well, we like to grow um, a bit of barley on, on wheat. And that's where you end up with it because you see a little bit in your wheat crop and you're looking at your rotation and you're saying, oh, I've got too many legumes going in this year. That paddock, oh, it'll, it'll do another year. So you whack it into barley and you've just got barley grass everywhere then. So it happens, can happen pretty quickly. But, um, yeah, so you think you've just got to bite the bullet and get on top of it, which in reality is really the story for every weed, I think. Yeah. yeah. I've got a question for John. <laughs> what preems? What works? Uh, what preem do you find works the best? Well, I don't know. I, well, I I believe Sakura has activity on it, but we don't use a lot of the. It's all the more expensive ones, from far as I can know. But I'm not a real expert on the chemicals. But basically, trifluorin does nothing, for, I think, and I think Sakura is the one, isn't it? I don't know. Yes, yeah, Sakura. Uh, Sakura is labelled as. Um, will have activity on it. All the other preems um, are just listed as suppression, pretty much. So yeah, secure is your option, but that's only in wheat, and it's only if you want to fork out for it. So it's not really a viable option when you're talking in terms of rotations. It might give you an option one year, but not year on year on year. It is. Um, well, that actually runs us out of time. Uh, Cam? Uh, yeah, so we sow a seven inch disc seeder and I love, I'm a huge fan of crop competition um, but I think the barley grass, whether the numbers mightn't quite be as good but it's still, the heads are still there, there's still plenty of numbers and I find that um, with a closer spacing it becomes a lot more vertical and the barley grass is actually a lot higher than the crop. So it shoots it up higher, definitely. Do you think you might be able to capture that in a seed destructor at all? 
Uh, yeah, well, that's the next thing I'm starting to look into, um, especially with an, uh, another property we have down south. Is ryegrass is huge, and the same thing. It's that's the next step. I reckon that the Mallee and that will be starting to look into. Definitely, it's starting to get a lot more momentum north. I reckon up Wagga area and that. Uh, a lot of people are starting to talk, and they're just waiting for that right machine to come out that doesn't wear out in a year. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good point, Cam. But the, we've we've got a we sow on 15 inch, but we've moved to uh, split row, trying to narrow because you definitely do see um, crop competition having an effect on weeds. And again, I mentioned before, like if you can get a really good canola, get a good stand and, you know, try and smother it out. But it's still, um, it's still not enough. I don't think you can limit, limit the numbers, but you'll never get on top of it. And I think, again, the issue with the harvest weed collection, which was mentioned before, is that barley grass basically just matures so early and it's so, um, just explodes, like Simon said before, as soon as anything hits it, it just seems to explode and go everywhere and blow in the wind. So I think it'd be a real challenge to get it into the header, I reckon. Yep. Okay. Um, well, that's about us up for the barley grass discussion. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to Simon and John, and I've got a bit of a gift here for you. So thank you very much for coming and talking to us all this morning. Thank you. Um, so hopefully that discussion has given you a bit of an idea about some ways you could try and control barley grass on your farm to help you get a better result and hopefully you're a little bit interested in seeing what the trial results are at Nullable, um, looking at the strategies that might come out of that that could help to control barley grass better. Um, so I'll now pass on to Brooke Bennett and Chris Warwick for the grain storage talk. Thank you. Extension program, thanks Kate. Um, and he's been delivering information on grain storage for the past 10 years. Um, so we're gonna run a bit of a QA and a session to get ready for the upcoming harvest and beyond. So I'll just pass over to you, Chris. Thanks, Brooke, I appreciate that. I, uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, traveling through Canada a couple of weeks ago and uh, did a bit of shopping while I was over there. Went and had a look at a jacket, being in Canada, I thought they were pretty good jackets. I went in and tried this one on and they said, uh, Oh, just be aware, sir, that that jacket's it's probably not the best, you know, it's, it's probably only good for minus 30. Uh, it's probably not going to be good if you're a real middle of winter minus 40 degrees, but um, little did they know, birch at zero degrees, I reckon is about the same as minus 30. Um, so uh, I'm glad I've had that today. Look, thanks for the invitation to come and speak, Brooke. Um, given September, we're probably running out of time to do a whole lot with grain storage for this harvest, but um, given there's a bit of grain around, we want to... Uh, maximise what we have got um, and, and try and give ourselves um, the best opportunity that we can uh, to get a good outcome with grain storage for this year. So I thought I'd run through um, a couple of things about what we can do to prepare for, for this year and give ourselves a, a good chance for having a good result with storage. Um, but primarily take your questions, figure out what it is that you guys want to know about um, around grain storage and try and answer your questions. Given we've got a nice small group here, um, I think we can do that. Um, it, just out of interest, who's heard me speak before? I've been around BCG a little bit, a few. Anyone heard Peter Botter speak in the past before we sadly lost him? Yep, good. So a lot of you will know the key messages. Um, excuse the, the repetition, um, but I, I will drum it home. The first one we want to we do, do at this time of year is hygiene. So grain storage hygiene is really about cleaning up any grain that might be left and removing uh, removing the chance of insects breeding through um, from one year to the next. So um, good chance to do that, and especially while it's cold. As soon as the weather starts warming up, we'll find that insects will start reproducing uh, more quickly and they'll start moving more. So while it's cold, uh, is, is the best time to do our hygiene. Uh, is anyone using dry side or, or a diatomaceous earth product? Yep, a few of you. Anyone thinking about using it? Yep, 
I really encourage you to use that after you've done your clean. Um, there's a sample there. It, it's a non-chemical product. It, it's, um, it's a mined product. Um, the way it works is actually, it's very abrasive. If you look at it under a microscope, and it scratches the waxy cuticle on the insect, and then they, they dehydrate. So it's a non-chemical mode of action. Um, I'd really encourage you, as a structural treatment, so after you've cleaned out your silos, cleaned out your header, your augers, chaser bins, all those sorts of things, um, put a bit of that dry side in. An easy method, a little blow vac gun with, uh, with the air compressor. Um, for a 100 tonne silo, you're looking at about 200 grams of dry side, so not much at all. Um, uh, the only warning I would put with it, if you are going to store um, a pulse or an oil seed, um, make sure you haven't got too much in there. Even give your silo a quick rinse just before harvest. I'd hate for it to, to get on some of those um, pulse grains where they really do look at colour. The other way, of course, is you can use your leaf blower, um, especially for your big flat bottom silos or sheds. Um, a leaf blower can also be a good way to put it out there. So that's the first thing um, I really wanted to, to encourage you guys to do uh, leading into harvest with your storage. The other thing I wanted to, to, uh, to really encourage you to do, who's got sealable silos? Don't be shy, put your hand up nice and high. Good. Who's done a pressure test on them in the last 12 months? Hmm, no hands. I'd encourage you to do that as well as part of your annual maintenance. So we often think about silos as something that sit there static um, and we go over in the shed and we work on the harvester and the trucks and we do all the maintenance on them, but we forget about the maintenance on the silos. I'd encourage you to have a look at them. Check if those seals are still, uh, they're still going to work. Check if any seals need replacing, any hatches been bent, um, the auger sometimes hit the silo. Um, and while you're doing it, have a look at your sealable silos and do a pressure test. So the first thing you want to do is check that our oil level. Can everyone see this all right from back there? Little demo silo. The first thing we want to do is check that our oil level in our pressure relief valve is actually at the middle mark. It's actually got enough oil in it. And we use a light hydraulic oil. I've used blue water, so it's easier to see. But a light hydraulic oil um, is what we want to aim for. And I'd, the reason I suggest we do a pressure test once a year before harvest, if we have got an issue, we've got a chance to fix it. While the silo is still empty, we've got a bit of time, we can, we can go and do something with it. That way, if we come back um, after harvest, we want to do a fumigation, we can be confident that we can get this silo to, to seal and hold the fumigation in there. So the process. Who knows how to do a... Uh, how to, how to do a pressure test. You might not have done it, but who knows how to do a pressure test? Don't be shy again. Surely, some of you. No one knows how to do a pressure test. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm speaking to the right audience then. It's really simple, and all we're trying to do, when I say pressure test, we're not trying to pump the silo up like a car tide, a 30 psi or something. We're putting less than one psi in there, and all we're doing is testing that that silo will hold pressure long enough to hold phosphine in there um, at two to 300 parts a million for seven to 10 days, which is what we need to kill all life stages of an insect. So that's all we're trying to test, that the, the silo will hold that pressure long enough. And it's very low pressure. So first thing we want to do, seal the silo up. We've checked all the seals, all the hatches. We want to pressurise the silo. A um, lo lot of them will have a little tyre, like a, 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 um, a tyre valve on the side, you can use an air compressor to put a bit of pressure in there. If you're going to use that, take the middle out of the tyre valve, it's really slow otherwise, it's slow enough as it is. A quicker way, a much quicker way, again a leaf blower. A little cone bottom silo will take about five seconds to pressurise with one of these, it's more about volume than pressure. Um, your big flat bottom silos, these will do it as well. If your silo has those uh, thermo siphon on the side, they'll often have a cap like a stormwater 90 mil PVC cap, so you can make yourself a little adapter, fits onto your, uh, y your blower there, and you can pressurise your silo really quickly, really easily. Um, otherwise, your air compressor, even a blow vac gun. So we pressurise the silo. I'm going to use my own internal air compressor for this one. Uh, 
and the oil will probably start to bubble, like we have got there. What we want to do is pressurise it until the oil levels are an inch apart. So that will be... One side they'll be at the bottom of the mark, and the other side they'll be at the top mark. So an inch apart. What we then want to do is time how long it takes for the oil level to drop from an inch apart to half an inch apart. Hence why we call it a half-life pressure test. So it's really not complicated. From inch apart to half an inch apart. And for an existing silo, we want that to be more than three minutes. So it's that simple. So we start timing away, and the silo, as good as the silo is, it'll probably still have some hole in it, and they'll start dropping down. As long as it takes more than three minutes for that to get halfway back, then we know that silo will hold gas long enough to kill insects at all life stages. Any questions on that? Great question. Yeah, great, really good question. So, question around the time of day to do it. When should we do a pressure test? Um, on a morning like this, it'll be really easy to get a false reading because you'll have cold air inside the silo, the sun comes out, heats the, 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 the roof of the silo, the wall of the silo, and it'll expand the air in there, and you'll get positive pressure without even pressurising your silo. So you'll get, a, you'll get an inaccurate reading. So the best time of day, um, ideally an overcast day with stable ambient conditions, or, or at the, the time of day, 1 to 3 p.m., when it's stable conditions, the sun's already out. Um, the best way to figure out if it's a, a reasonable time to do a pressure test is just seal the silo up. Seal all your silos up if you're doing a few at a time, and come back and check them after a few minutes and check if the oil levels have moved. If the oil levels haven't moved, it's either not sealed, or it's sealed but it's stable ambient conditions. So that's what we really want, stable ambient conditions for doing a pressure test. Those that are really keen get up before dawn and do it, but I don't know too many farmers that are that keen. Um, so that's what we're looking for, overcast day or, or uh, after midday when it's, um, you know, the sun's not changing the temperature of the, the air inside the silo. Does it matter whether it's full or empty? Another good question. The silo, that is, full or empty of grain. Really good question. Um, there's argument for both. So there's argument for doing a pressure test when it's empty so that if there is an issue, you can fix it. Um, it is actually much easier to get a good result when it's empty because there's more air in there. Um, the other, ideally, we would do it once a year when it's empty to, to, to do our maintenance. The other time we would do a pressure test is just before we want to fumigate to tell whether we've actually got all the hatches closed properly. We've got everything. The other thing that can happen with some of the, particularly some of the older silos, um, is that when we fill the silo, it can put pressure on the outlet at the bottom. The grain, the weight of the grain puts pressure on the outlet, and that can compromise the seal of the silo. So that's why we might want to do it when it's full as well. And that's when we're actually going to fumigate when it's full, so it makes sense to do it then. Um, that's probably enough from, from me on telling you guys what, what you need to know. What do you guys want to know about grain storage? What are your questions? What have you, why have you come in this room um, to learn about grain storage today? Surely there's got to be a question. Is there much resistance? Good question. To weevils, insects? Yeah, good. There is. Um, and I assume we're talking about phosphine resistance? Yeah. Yep. So phosphine resistance is still growing. Um, and the reason it is growing is because we're using phosphine in silos that are not sealed. So we're using them in those older silos that some, a lot of them probably sold to us as sealed or sealable or fumigatable or those sorts of terminology. They're sealed pretty well. They keep the weather out. You know, they're not bad, um, but they don't hold the gas long enough to kill the insects at all of the life stages. So we all know in an insect, grab my little text here, an insect. I can't draw, so I'm just going to put a circle. Thank you. 
I'm going to call this one adult. Adult stage of the life cycle insect. Uh, the adult lays an egg. That egg turns into a larvae or pupae next? Larvae. After the larvae, we have pupae. And then that turns back into an adult. The life cycle of an insect. What happens with phosphine is that the adult and the larvae are active parts of the life cycle. They'll take in the phosphine, it'll kill them. The egg and the pupae are dormant phases. They won't take in the phosphine, won't kill them. So when we try and use phosphine in something that's not sealable, um, it won't perform that pressure test, we'll kill most of the adults. We'll probably kill a few of these, but we won't kill these. And they'll get a sub-lethal dose and continue to breed. And that's where our resistance comes from. So by having a gas-tight sealable silo, we keep the gas in there long enough that the egg develops to the larvae, and the larvae develops, so the pupae develops to the adult, and they'll take in the phosphine and be killed. So that's why we've got resistance, um, and, and that's why we're adding to it. So, um, question? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So aeration cooling. How, how effective is that in, in controlling insects? What we're aiming to do with aeration cooling, uh, firstly, is slow down the breeding life cycle. So at ideal conditions, 30 degrees, 35 degrees, um, and, and even 12 and a half percent moisture, this life cycle, about four weeks can happen in four weeks. If we cool that grain down, even if we cool it down to the mid-low 20 degrees, we change that from four weeks to more like 12 weeks. So we slow that whole breeding cycle down, slowed it right down. If we can get that down even lower, so that's at, say, 22 degrees, if we can get that right down aim for 18 degrees, that life cycle will stop for most insects. So different insects, it will stop at different points. Um, some 18, if you've got the rice weevil, the little one with a little snout that you often see, you need 15 degrees to stop him breeding. But even at 18, it'll, it'll slow the life cycle right down. So that's what we're trying to do with aeration cooling, is slow that life cycle down to a point where the, it even stops breeding. Yeah. have to be careful you don't suck moisture in, yeah, especially on a morning like this. We, we often think cold, frosty morning, it's dry, but have a look at a roof in here, it's actually, it's, it's not that dry, it's high, high humidity. So that's where an automatic controller on your aeration cooling will really help you out. Um, it'll select the, the coolest, driest air for you and do the job most efficiently. Um, what we're trying to aim for, and I've got some some brochures up here, little booklets on aeration um, cooling for you. I'll open one up to give you an example of how important it is to have a look at what conditions we're actually trying to run the fans in. Who's got fans, by the way? Who's got some aeration cooling fans? A few of you? Yep. Anyone got automatic controllers on them? One. It's so, it's so common. We, we've got aeration cooling, we don't use them because we don't know when to run them. I'll give you, come and get one of these. Um, give you an example, even 20 degrees, ambient conditions, 20 degrees outside, we harvest our grain at probably, what, 35, 30 degrees, whatever the ambient conditions are, yep. If we can, if we can get air in there at 20 degrees, at 30% relative humidity, our grain temperature will come down to about 16. That makes sense. So even though the air is 20 degrees, because it's low humidity, it has a better cooling effect. If we suck an air in at 20 degrees and say 60% relative humidity, our grain temperature is probably only going to get 21. So it's not as efficient. And that's where the controllers really give you the gain. They'll, they'll do it efficiently. The other thing that they'll do, as you, you pointed out, is that they won't run when relative humidity is too high. They'll turn off. 
to stop adding moisture into the grain. You, you, you don't want to start wetting grain up. I sometimes get the question, oh, isn't it good to, when we harvest grain really dry, I'd love to add a bit of moisture in and add a bit more weight. What happens is we add moisture just around the aeration ducting. That's pretty confined. And we end up with a, a really good little mould patch going on in there. It's not enough airflow to push the moisture right through the grain. It's, it, it's really not, not going to happen. Yeah, we've actually got in the room um, one of the manufacturers of the aeration systems, um, David from AgriDry. He's going to make us a quick comment. I was just going to um, say the amount of water that you have to add into a 100 tonne silo, for example, um, if you want to add 1% to your overall moisture, you've got to add 1,130-odd litres to increase that by 1%. So the biggest factor at the inlet, like Chris said, is you may get some wetting there, but if you've got your airflow happening, um, it's going to push that moisture through. Um, and, and the controllers really take a lot of that risk away. So. The other thing I want to say about aeration cooling, the first bit of the process is really a lot simpler than what I've just explained there. So that's the hardest bit, trying to get the really cool air to do your last bit of cooling, to get it down from your, your, your 22 degrees down to 15. That's the hard bit. The easy bit with aeration cooling, as soon as the grain's gone into the silo and covered the aeration ducting, turn your fan on. Doesn't matter whether it's 10 degrees outside or 40 degrees outside, turn your fan on. The only time you don't want to run your fan is if your relative humidity is over about 85%, which is going to be rare at harvest time. Um, you don't want to run it for too long at that. So turn your fan on constantly for about, depends how big your silo is, about the first three to five days. I'd say five days. No harm in running it um, constantly for your first five days. And this is what the controllers will, will replicate and they'll do it more efficiently. Um, what we're trying to do with that first bit of air is even the grain conditions. So we even the temperature, even the moisture, um, get that harvest heat blown out, out of the grain. Nice uniform conditions. After we've done that, we try and pick the coolest 12 hours per day for about the next five to seven days. So that's when we're really trying to pull this, the, the first 10 degrees off the temperature. We're trying to pull it from a harvest temperature bring it down to our mid-20s. And that can be done in a couple of weeks. Usually that's, that doesn't take that long to bring that harvest heat out of the grain. So handful of days, run it constantly. Next handful of days, try and pick the coolest half of the day for aeration. And then after that, what the controllers aim to do is about the, the coolest 24 hours in a week or 100 hours in the month and that will try and pick the coolest and driest 100 hours in the month. That's, that's what we're trying to do with aeration cooling. That's our aim. So if you break it down, it doesn't have to be that, that complicated. Even if you don't get it down, you've got aeration, and we say, yes, aim for 15 to 18 degrees. Even if you can only get it to 20, you're still a lot better off than leaving it in there at 30, 35. At 35 degrees and at harvest temperature and moisture, insects just love to breed. It's the, the perfect breeding environment. Other questions? I'm sure there's more out there. Fantastic question. I, I swear I didn't feed the question. It's perfect timing. Thank you. What do we do with unsealable silos? Well, we're not going to take a bulldozer to them. They're, they're, they're still good silos. Um, hold a lot of grain and there's a lot of them out there. So what do we do with them? Um, people talk about retro sealing. Can we come and seal them up? My recommendation there is it's very expensive to seal them up and not that successful. So I'd suggest save your money and put it towards next time you're replacing them or building new silos, buy some gas type ones. Put your money towards the new. What you can do to improve the older ones is add aeration cooling. So you can get a fan, um, it's not too hard to mount, um, a little bit of ducting, and add aeration cooling to it. What that'll do is give you time. So if you do get insects in there, you've cooled it down, their reproduction is gonna be slowed down significantly to the point it might even stop. 
So you can hold grain in that silo a lot longer. The other things you can do with your unsealable storage, including your sheds, um, bunkers, those sorts of things that we, we harder to fumigate, um, we can add um, use a protectant if we're storing cereals in there. Uh, and our buyers don't mind us using a protectant. Um, we, can, we can absolutely, that, that's where I think protectants really have their place. If they're older, unsealable storage, um, hygiene, aeration, protectants, they're all preventative measures. They're trying to set us up to give us the best chance to not have an insect issue. Um, and the phosphine, that's, that's the last resort if we have an insect issue. Um, we've got a way out. Um, even if we've got a, a whole line of old unsealable silos but we've got a few sealable, again, at least we've got a way, if we do have an insect problem, our aeration didn't work or we've stored grain for a lot longer than we first planned, we can transfer grain from our older silos to our newer sealable silos, do our fumigation and outload. Bit of mucking around, but by doing that diligently, we don't add to our resistance that we spoke about. Sorry, there was a, I'll go one, two. We've got an old bunker that we can't seal, so we treat the server pack, it's fantastic. Yep. There's incredible odour in here. We try and empty it out early because the leaf is in the central silo. You know, we feel we all. Yes. The other trick we do is put a um, plastic on top. Yes. Put a, a thousand um, fumigate honey tongue underneath it. Okay. Yeah, we do that initially. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Has it got any aeration on it? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's a good point. This powder that I had before can be applied as a slurry. You mix it up as a slurry. Pretty hard on pumps, but you can put it on a slurry, which is particularly good for your bigger silos and your sheds where you're trying to, to get up into different areas. So. Um, Absolutely, you can do that. Something I, I, I hear your point about the temperature of the grain when you put a protectant on. Um, protectants will, will last longer if the grain is cooler as well. So the, the efficacy, the, the longevity of those products, if we want to get, you know, we spend a bit of money to put these products on, we want to get the best out of them, they'll actually last longer if it's cooler as well. Not only does the product last longer, We've got less insect breeding for the product to have to work on. So we're, again, we're giving it every chance. It's like when we're spraying our paddocks, um, we, we figure out the rate of chemical that we need to kill the weed, and then we add to that well, what water rate, what oil, what droplet size do we want. You know, we're trying to give that chemical every chance it can to work to do its best job. Same in the grain storage. We can just apply the chemical, it's not magic. We've got to give it every chance to do its best job, and cooling will help that too. Yeah. There's an argument there's no oxygen in there too. I, I haven't done research around that to figure out why that is. Um, yeah. The, the, you raise a good point too about the, the heating and putting the plastic over. Um, we talked a bit, a bit, a lot about gas tight storage. A another myth that's out there is that we got gas tight storage or sealed storage to seal it up to keep the insects out. Also not the case will run into troubles. And again, like we've got today, we've got a bit of moisture in here, we've got condensation. If we seal a silo up all year round, we'll get condensation in there. And it's also really hard on the structure of the silo because it's heating and cooling every day. This oil relief valve is going to be bubbling away, pushing pressure on the seals in and out every day. It's really hard work on the, on the silo. So the only time we want to seal it up is for fumigation. The rest of the time, we're not venting, Ideally aerating, but venting to keep it keep it fresh. There's another question yeah, here. Yeah, probably answer. My question was on silo bags, what experience you've had with those in terms yep. of insects. So we've used them not a lot, but don't seem to have much problem with insects. Yep, yep. I don't know what you thought on that. Yeah, silo bags, grain bags. Um, as we heard this morning, great, great option. Primarily a short-term option, harvest logistics, that sort of thing. Obviously, the longer the time we want to store in bags, the more diligent we have to be. 
and we have to get our ground preparation right. We have to be diligent with our patching and, and, and getting them nice and straight and all those sorts of things to, again, give us the, ourselves the best chance. Um, typically, we don't have a lot of insect issues in bags, and I think part of that is because we don't store very long in them a lot of the time. When we do want to store a bit longer, that's when we start to see the, the issues. And, and again, combine that with if we haven't been diligent, there's a few holes, a bit of moisture got in, um, grain's gone in warm, um, all those sorts of things make it a more attractive environment for insects. Yeah. To fumigate a bag? Yeah. Inside the bag? Yeah. Yep. Um, you can fumigate in a bag, it's quite a process. Uh, one of the hardest parts about fumigating in a bag is actually getting the gas back out to vent it. So, um, happy to chat to you, maybe we're pushing for time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Can I chat to you afterwards and we'll go through the process of how to fumigate in a bag because it's probably a couple of minutes. Um, but yeah, it can be done. It can be done. Uh, I, I'd suggest it's something you'd want to do only if you have to. It's not a preventative or a do it anyway, it's probably one that you would you only do if you have to because it's a fair bit of mucking around to, to get it right. And if you don't get it right, you risk delivering grain. Might not have had insects in it, but you've delivered grain that's now got phosphine residue and you still get knocked back. So, yeah, we, we do need to get that one right. Um, I'm going to be around till lunchtime, so if you guys want to chat further, um, I'm the guy in the Canadian coat. Come, come and have a chat, happy to, um, happy to answer your questions. There's some booklets up here, I'll leave here for a few hours as well. Um, help yourself, um, more than welcome to, to grab one of them. We better finish up. So I've got the blue flag out the front, we're moving on to cereal varieties and the disease update, um, or you can jump ship to another colour. But if you're with me, follow, follow me out the front to the marquee.